Hi, Hannah. I'm going to take a look at your portfolio for college admission. What I'm going to do is start out with some general comments about your entire portfolio overall, and then I'll go through and I will critique each piece individually. What comes across right away in your portfolio is this incredible passion and dedication you have towards painting and drawing the human figure. I think what's impressive about your figure pieces and also these hand drawings is that it's quite clear to me that quite a lot of the pieces in your portfolio have been done from life. And that's so wonderful to see. So frequently when I look at portfolios, almost everything that has a figure in it has been copied from a photograph. You have a self-portrait that's been done from a mirror. So I'm really excited to see that you have this commitment towards drawing from life. There does seem to be a range of that. Like I would say images number 10, 11, 1, and the portrait of Frida Kahlo, I would say those are obviously drawn from photographs. I would think about ways when you draw from a photograph to manipulate the image a lot further because your life drawings have so much energy and liveliness to them that by comparison, the pieces that are created from photographs, they really stick out as sore thumbs. So you have to find a way to more dramatically change the image when you are creating a drawing from a photograph because that difference in the pieces in your portfolio is really startling and I think isn't doing so well in terms of comparing one piece to another. Another thing that I find really interesting about your work is that your paintings are actually much looser than your drawings, which usually is not the case. Most of the time when I look at people's drawings and paintings, people have a much easier time being looser, a lot more gestural, much more spontaneous when they're making a drawing. And the tendency is for people to really tighten up when they start to paint. You're actually the opposite. I would say that actually you are tighter and a lot more conservative when it comes to your drawings. And really I see the experience experimentation and the boldness in your paintings. Like for example, image number two, I think has a really startling expression to it. You also have this portrait number 17, which is very expressionistic. And then for example, in the self-portrait image number three, you're working with more daring color schemes. So that's really wonderful to see that already at such an early age, you have such a confident command of your brushwork. That's very uncommon for me to be seeing. I was also really happy to see that you have an etching in here, which is image number 16. Printmaking is one of those mediums that just a lot of high school students don't have experience with, much less in Talio printmaking, which includes techniques like sugar lift and aquatint and etching. So I'm really happy to see that. I would love to see more though. I think it'd be great for you to get perhaps another one or two etchings in here so you can really show off a little bit more your expertise in that area. Although you do have quite a few black and white pieces, the color pieces are quite prominent in your portfolio. Frequently, I see that students are afraid of color and they don't want to use it in a really dramatic, adventurous way. And I think it's clear when I look at images, say number four and number eight, that you are not shying away from color at all. I'm really glad to see that you're really embracing it as a visual tool for your pieces. Couple things to consider moving forward on developing your portfolio. The first thing is that your passion for figures and portraits is a curse and a blessing. I'm excited that you love the figure and portrait so much. However, you don't want that to become a limitation. And what I'm seeing in your portfolio is that you pretty much are only painting figures and portraits. I would say the one exception would be image number 16, which does seem like it has more of a narrative quality to it. And so you need to really expand your subject matter because you don't want a portfolio that's so specific. You really want to show that you're a little bit more prolific in terms of subject matter. So for example, if you're painting a portrait or a figure, don't just do that, maybe add an environment or a space for the figure to exist within. So for example, maybe the figure is sitting in a living room or maybe it's sitting on a couch or maybe it's outdoors on a bench. You really need to give the figures more of a context because I'm looking at all of your figure drawings and pretty much all of them have these very blank, very abstract backgrounds. And so it seems like backgrounds are an area that you're ignoring in a lot of your images. And the thing is, figures really 
really need a space to exist within because that's another way of communicating what the figure is doing is to show how they are interacting in their spaces and also just to give your paintings and drawings a much greater sense of depth. I would also say it would be really great for you to show your ability to paint objects and to draw objects. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to make a still life painting. For example, you could have an image of a figure that's sitting on a couch. Maybe there's a table nearby with some objects or a lamp on it. Maybe there's some shoes on the floor. There's different ways you can integrate objects into your paintings and drawings, which are figurative. However, I really think you need to work on that because what I would love to see in some of your drawings is a much greater command of many different types of textures. So could you draw a very smooth surface? Could you draw a really rough, really textured surface? Could you draw a surface which is very reflective? Because if you're only drawing the figure, you are not getting an opportunity to show that. What I would recommend is go to artprof.org and I would watch the Still Life course because that video course really gets into a lot of depth about different ways that you can set up still lives and make them exciting and dynamic because because typically a lot of people think about still life as being really boring. Oh, it's just apples and peaches and vases, but it doesn't have to be that way. Still life can be extremely exciting. You just have to take the initiative to actually make it happen. In your portfolio, I would say another thing to think about is you don't wanna to have too many unfinished pieces. It's okay, for example, image number seven is quite obviously a very quick gesture drawing, but you have a lot of pieces that look like they should have been finished but weren't. Like I would say image number five seems like it was abandoned too quickly. I would say image number six seems very unresolved. You wanna get more pieces that are more complete. Like I would say image number two is very obviously a complete image. It's okay to have gesture drawings like these hand drawings 12, 13, and 14. But to me, 12, 13, and 14 are all basically doing the same thing. And that's sort of a missed opportunity because those are two pieces that could be showing your artistic range. So out of 12, 13, and 14, if you were, say, submitting your portfolio today, I would say take out one of those and put in two new pieces that are very different from each other. You do have a couple sketchbook pieces. So numbers 9, 10, and 11. And looking at those, those don't really feel like sketchbook drawings to me. They feel like they're more complete drawings that just happen to be drawn in a sketchbook. And so the issue is that when I look at those drawings, the middle of the sketchbook, the spine that's going down the middle, is really distracting. So I would say if you're going to work on a drawing that's going to be more sustained, do it outside of your sketchbook on a bigger, nicer sheet of paper. What I want to see in your sketchbook is your brainstorming, your ideas and development, because as I'm looking at these sketchbook drawings, I'm not seeing that. All I'm seeing is repetition of what's going on in your figurative pieces. The way you're using your sketchbook right now is just using it as another surface. And I wanna see you brainstorming, developing ideas, uh, manipulating and transforming different things. I wanna see your artistic thinking process. And right now we're not seeing that. Art schools are really interested in seeing that part of your process. I think number one, you should start doing thumbnail sketches for your pieces. You should really start thinking about composition because in pretty much all these pieces, it's the same composition. It's either a portrait or a figure stuck right in the middle of the page with a very blank background. And you need to change that because compositionally speaking, I get the feeling that you're not composing. I get the feeling that the paper is just a surface. So I would definitely consider making a, a very dramatic shift in terms of how you compose pieces. Like what would happen if you took the figure and you had it in the upper left-hand corner? What would happen if you cropped half the size of the face? Because you just don't have a lot of diversity in terms of composition right now. A lot of it's very monotonous. I'd love to see you get a lot more adventurous with mixed media because what I'm seeing is very straightforward. Okay, this is a charcoal drawing. This is an acrylic painting. This is a marker drawing. I mean, what if you started something with charcoal 
and then maybe added marker nearby and then put charcoal over the marker? Or what if you started with an ink wash drawing and then let it dry and then put charcoal on top of that? So it would be really nice to see you experimenting more with the materials because it seems very limited the way that you're using it. For example, you could think about if you're oil painting, you could get uh, that cold wax medium, which you can mix into the surface of the paint. There's lots of different gel mediums that you can mix if you're using acrylic. Some of them are very thick, some of them are coarse. So just to really expand your ideas in terms of what materials you're using, what I would recommend is go to artprof.org and go to the art supply section because the art supply section has all types of more obscure art supplies that a lot of people don't know about and that you can try out and we have recommendations and really specific information about those. You do have one 3D piece which is image number 15. And I like that you have that 3D piece. However, it's very much a repetition of the hand drawings. It'd be really nice for you to do a sculpture that's a totally different subject. It'd also be nice for you to do maybe another two sculptures, two 3D pieces. We have a lot of 3D projects on artprof.org that are all different media. There's balsa wood, there's metal, there's chipboard, there's foam board. And so for you to really expand your range, in terms of 3D would be great because 3D is one of those mediums. A lot of people don't have it in their college portfolios. And so if you have 3D work that's really strong and really prominent in your portfolio, it really, I think, distinguishes you in a way that other types of media don't do so much. When you draw from a photograph, you tend to tighten up a lot and you tend to overblend. Like for example, if I look at image number six and seven, I'm guessing that both of those are drawn from life, from a model. Those both have a lot of energy. The marks are very exciting and very direct and very honest. Image number 10 and 11, I see you sort of blending your drawing to death. You're blending so much that the surface becomes very mushy and it lacks structure. So I would just recommend when you're doing the drawing, just really control the blending because I find that you don't need a lot of blending for a drawing to really work out. And usually when I do blend, I save it for the very end and I'm very careful that I don't blend all over the place because you can easily just smudge your drawing to death. Okay, so let's go through and let's talk about each piece individually. You have two paintings of artists. You have this Rembrandt painting and you also have Frida Kahlo. I don't think these are good pieces to include in your portfolio because quite obviously they're done from photographs or maybe you painted them directly from a Rembrandt or a Frida Kahlo painting. Neither option is good. Those references are not helping you very much and I really see these paintings as just copies, and you don't want to do that. You really want to make artwork that's 100% original. I mean, I never thought that being original would make you stand out because in my opinion, everything you make should be original. But I guess apparently a lot of people don't feel that way. And you're going to get a lot of people who apply to art school who don't have a lot of original work. Be the exception and be the person who creates imagery that's 100% yours, that you really own. Because I can see in this Rembrandt painting that you have beautiful work work. Especially, I would say the forehead is probably my favorite part of this painting. There are beautiful strokes in there. You have a lot of layering. I love the blues that are in the face. So technically speaking, there's some really strong work in this painting. But for me, I can't get past the fact that it's a Rembrandt image, either from a painting or an illustration from him quite obvious in this piece that you spent all your time on the face and that you pretty much ignored the rest of it. And I know that the background probably is not as exciting as the face, but you can't show that. You can't show us that you're bored. I can tell that you had so much fun with the face and that you were bored with the rest of the piece. So you need to make sure you're really engaging with every single part of the composition. This is one of my favorite pieces in your portfolio because of the brushwork. I think the brushwork is really outstanding. I think it's really bold. It has a wonderful liveliness to it. It's almost anxious in a way. It makes me think a lot of Alberto Giacometti's oil paintings. He did quite a few of those which have a very nervous quality to the facial expressions. And I think you did really well in there. The other thing that's nice about this portrait is that it really seems like a portrait of a specific person. It doesn't seem like some random generic person you happen to paint. He really seems like he has a very strong character and personality. 
That said, though, I think you really need to get more adventurous with the color. This, to me, feels like that stereotypical browns and yellow ochres. But if you look at the human figure, there's actually a lot of cool tones in there. You wouldn't think that you could see blues or greens or purples in a human figure, but there's really a lot of them. One artist who I think would be really terrific for you to look at in terms of getting more vibrant colors in a portrait would be Lucien Freud. His paintings, if you look at them really quickly, it looks like run-of-the-mill skin tone because it's very convincing. But if you get up real close to a Lucien Freud painting, you will see blue tones, you will see green tones, and they really create just a gorgeous surface of skin. So I'd love to see that because this portrait is too much of the same brown, too much of the same yellow ochre. The other issue I have with this piece is I really don't like the composition because it's about as boring as it gets. You have one face, dead center, it's perfectly symmetrical. You want to avoid symmetry, you want to avoid being right in the middle of the page. Not because those things cannot be good, because they could be good in a specific situation, but the thing is, Right now, I get the feeling that you are not thinking about placement of the subject on the page and that these were not deliberate choices on your part in terms of composition, but rather just a default reaction. And that's usually what I see in high school portfolios is people stick things right in the middle of the page. They make things symmetrical just because they didn't think about composition. So I really want to see you engaging with this because the background is pretty much blank. And to me, it's just as bad as having a blank white background. Like there's just nothing back there. I mean, what if you put an environment or you suggested architecture back there? There's a million ways that you could really get that to be more exciting. This self-portrait I'm excited about because it looks quite large. It says it's 46.8 inches tall. So I'm excited about the ambition of that because there is something about working on a large scale, which is so different than working on a smaller piece. I do think though that it's disappointing that this painting looks really unfinished and it looks blatantly unfinished. I think sometimes there's pieces where it's a little bit unclear. Well, maybe it's not, maybe it is. This piece, it's so clear that you invested time in the face and then it looks like you went for a cup of coffee and then never came back because the lower half of the painting is so obviously completely unresolved that that's a problem. So I would say that in your paintings, you want to treat every single square inch of the painting as if it really matters because a pattern that I'm starting to see in your painting so far is that you put tons of time in the face and you totally neglect everything else. So it's like you're investing all your time in one spot and then everything else gets left behind. And if you look at great paintings, they're not like that. Like if you look at Jerry Coe's painting, The Raft of the Medusa, there isn't a single section of that painting that looks like it wasn't considered or thought about or composed. So this piece I'm excited about because it has a really strange background. I, I like how hot and vibrant it is, but I do think you can do more with that. And I do think that maybe if you could work with bigger brushes, that would help you too. I am guessing from looking at your paintings that you are not using a very big brush. And that is the case for a lot of painters. They paint with a medium shaped brush or smaller. I mean, when I paint, I start my paintings with a two inch wide brush, which is very scary for some people, but a big brush will get you to be so much bolder. I see you getting a little fussy in the eyes particularly. So see if you can loosen up. A big brush will really get you to do that. This self-portrait, I think, is much better than the last one. Number one, it looks a lot more complete, but number two, it seems to have more emotion. Like when I look at this self-portrait, there's a sterility to the expression. It seems like she isn't doing anything particularly stirring in terms of emotion. This piece, you can see the almost hollow expression in the face. She seems like somebody who's very sad, very morose. And part of it is the slight tilt of the head to the left. And I do like the composition of this much better because she's not dead center. You get the sway of her moving to the left. And also the addition of the hand makes a very big difference as well because that is a really beautiful gesture that you're putting in there. I think one thing you really need to think about though is activating the hair because although there isn't 
isn't a lot of the hair. Hair can be incredibly expressive. And right now it seems like you're skipping over the hair almost as if it doesn't matter, but it does. It really can make a huge difference in your painting. I would be careful about this yellow that you're placing all over the place. It seems like it's overused. I feel as I look at the painting that it's the same yellow over and over and over again. I don't know if you're mixing with a palette knife, but if you're not and you're mixing with your brushes, get a palette knife because a palette knife, not only is it terrific for mixing colors on your palette, but it's great to paint with. So you can take a palette knife, you can scrape paint on the surface, get a more textured, more loose, exciting mark. And so what I would say with these yellows is just make sure they're a little bit different. Maybe this one over here has a little bit more yellow. This one's a little bit more orange. This one has a little bit more white because once we start to see, oh, she's whipping out that same yellow again, we get very bored very quickly. This portrait seems so underdeveloped that I have trouble having a lot to say about it. It seems like a good beginning, but it's so barely worked on that I don't think it should be a portfolio piece. If you have a piece that is obviously a gesture drawing in a life drawing class, I think that's a different story. But this piece I would either take out entirely or I would start it totally, well, I guess I would just start it over again because there's not a lot that's happening in terms of composition. There's not a lot of expression. And so I tend to be more drawn to the pieces that seem composed and that also seem like they have a much stronger story. This piece, same thing, it's so underdeveloped. I don't know what kind of paper you're using, but you really need to make sure that you're using charcoal paper because this to me has this really strange grainy texture to it. My guess is that it's on newsprint or a very thin paper that's just not very strong. So I would say what you need to do is get a paper that's a lot more durable. And I think the issue with this piece is that there's too many highlights all over the place. You need to be a lot more conscious about what direction the light is coming from. Like when I look at the thigh, it really seems like the light is coming from the left and the right. And so try to be a lot more consistent about your lighting situation. This gesture drawing I think is pretty good. I do wish that you didn't use quite so much black in it because the black seems very overbearing, a little bit too dominant, and it'd be really nice for you to think more structurally about the piece, to really think about the joints, like the elbow on the right-hand side, which is just a circle, doesn't make any sense, like anatomically speaking, that doesn't have any structural meaning to it, and don't avoid the head. What I see a lot in gesture drawings is people will make just this egg or golf ball for the head and then they work on the rest of the figure. Now, if I look at the neck area, you really have taken the time to draw on some of the musculature, you've drawn some of the uh, clavicle bones, but the face seems completely ignored. I'm not saying you need to draw a face, but you need to draw some of the structure on the face. So for example, draw the jawbone, draw the chin, draw the cheekbones, really start to put in some of the eye sockets. So in just drawing this fast, you cannot put in eyes, nose, and mouth. It's, it's just too small. It takes too long to do that, but you can put in that structure of the skull. So watch out for that when you're doing these figure gestures. This piece I like quite a bit because I think that the painterly quality of your brushwork is quite good. I do think that you should think about mixing your blacks more though. This seems like black out of the tube. And I think you can experiment like, for example, with lizard and crimson, you can mix it with Viridian. That makes a very deep purple that looks like black, but actually has a little bit more of a dynamic quality to it. But again, this feels very unfinished. I'm guessing it was probably done in a life drawing class, so probably you ran out of time. But I think this is probably a piece I wouldn't put in the portfolio because it's too underdeveloped for me to really get a full sense of your technique. This piece I like a lot. In fact, it really reminds me of Lucian Freud's etchings, which you should definitely take a look at. And what I like about this piece is this person really seems like they have a personality. I love the distortion in the mouth. I love the fact that the eyes look like they're barely open. And you can see that what I'm responding to is the pieces that really are very specific, that seem like they tell some type of story. It doesn't have to be a very involved, complicated story, but I 
I really feel like I know who this guy is. And I do think it's a lot more stylized for you. I think that the piece seems less about replicating what you saw and more about capturing a feeling and an emotion that you want this person to express. And also just the line work is so loose and so strong and active that I really respond to that as well. This piece, and I would also say the piece afterwards, I don't think these are good pieces for your portfolio because they have the spine of the book in the middle, which I think is really distracting. And I think in these two pieces, you're just blending and smudging way too much. And so the issue is that, especially in this image, what's happening is the face is starting to turn to mush. You're losing that skeletal structure that you had, for example, in that life drawing. This piece is a little bit better, but then the transition between the highlights and the shadows seem too harsh. And so for me, the shadows feel very flat in this piece. And then again, we also have the same situation where you put all your time into the face, you totally ignore the ear and the hair, and that's also the same case here. So what I'm seeing in a lot of these pieces is the same issues from piece to piece are being repeated all the time. And it's not to say that you can't have issues with your pieces, because I think most of us are never 100% perfectly satisfied with everything. But if you make these mistakes, make new mistakes. Don't just keep repeating the same thing over and over again, because that's really the way you're going to expand your repertoire. These three hand drawings, I say this one, and this one, first of all, I really like this Copic marker one because this one has much more volume than say this one and this one. And I think part of it is that Copic markers are so great for blending, but I don't think you've done enough here. I think you can be a lot more adventurous with the Copic markers. I would get a whole bunch that are all different shades, all different colors. It'd be so much fun to see one of these hand drawings just developed a lot more. My guess is that these are drawn from life. Maybe you pose for yourself because it seems like they do have that liveliness that you get when you draw from life. These two, I think, feel pretty flat to me. I feel like there's too much outlining and not enough emphasis on the middle of the piece. This piece, I do like the center of the palm. I think that's quite good. This drawing, I think this shadow is too harsh it feels almost like a hole in the drawing as opposed to the shadow, which I know you're trying to show. This piece is much better. I like the elasticity of this part of the skin, the way it stretches across, but I would really play with markers a lot more. And actually we have a course on artprof.org about how to draw with markers. And Lauren, the person who runs that tutorial, does talk quite a bit about how to blend and mix with Copics. It'd be great for you to take a look at that. I love that you have a 3D piece. I think it's great that it's done in concrete. <clears throat> I'm not sure if you cast this from something, but I'm guessing that's probably what it was because you can't exactly hand build with concrete. The one thing I would say about this image is you got to take a much better photograph of it because the stuff in the background is really, really distracting. Even this black in the upper left-hand corner, I think makes it really hard to see the piece really clearly. We have a page on artprof.org that explains really simple things you can do to photograph your 3D work to make it look better. Because I can tell this is a good piece, but the background is so cluttered that it's hard for me to see the piece clearly. So take a look at that page and reshoot a new photograph because I do think this is a good 3D piece. It's just you're not representing it in the best light possible. This piece I'm very interested in, number one, because it's an etching. And number two, because it's so different in terms of imagery compared to all of your other pieces. I love that you have animals in this piece. It seems like there's a story. It seems like there's a place, there's architecture, there's an environment that these birds exist within. And that's really terrific. However, I do feel that the piece is almost divided into two sections. There's like the top section and then this dividing horizontal line and then the section with the birds. And I think you need to figure out how those two sections relate because it almost seems like the architecture on top is like weighing on top of the birds. And I don't really know why they're doing that. Another thing is try to really pump up your use of gray tones because the vast majority of this etching is all just totally black or blank plate or just straight lines. 
And so the parts that get me excited would be the lower left-hand corner, the lower right-hand corner. So those areas where you start to layer and crosshatch are more exciting. You also got to be careful about your wiping. I can tell looking in the corners especially that you haven't wiped the plate thoroughly enough. I can see a lot of streakiness in there. So be a little bit more clear when you're using the tarlatan to wipe it. I'm guessing this is a dry point print that you do a better job with the technique because that definitely does show up in the final piece. This piece I really like in terms of how confrontational it is. It's a really strong piece that almost attacks you visually, and I like that a lot. However, I do think that the style that you're painting it in is too much the same. For example, the eyes, the beard, the hands, all three of those sections are painted exactly the same way. But the thing is, eyes are not like beards and beards are not like hands. A beard should have the texture of the hair. The eyes should have a glossiness to them. You should have wrinkles in the hands. And so this is a situation where you have a really exciting style, but it's not varied enough. It's too much the same thing over and over again. And so we start to get bored because we feel that it's the same shape that we're seeing in all the pieces. And it also feels like the same blue. I feel like this is a blue that's straight out of the tube. You added black, you added white. There's a little bit of yellow. You have to mix your colors more. It's very clear that you're not doing that very much in this piece. So really get that palette knife and start mixing away. I don't know what kind of palette you're using, but I would really recommend that you make a glass palette because what you do is you take a sheet of foam board, a sheet of gray paper, and a sheet of glass, and you put foam board and then the gray paper on top and then the glass on top, and then you tape together the sides with duct tape and a glass palette is very permanent and it's really easy to mix and clean. So a palette's very important to get because if you don't have a good palette, it's impossible to mix when you're painting. This piece with Frida Kahlo, I think, suffers from the same issues that I talked about in the Rembrandt piece. This piece, I'm guessing, is also done from a photograph, but I think it's more exciting in terms of the brushwork. I think particularly it seems like you engage with the hair a lot more, but similar thing, I'm seeing the exact same brush stroke, and I think really take advantage of the clothing. The clothing here is very expressive. You've got all these folds and all these shapes. It would be really nice for you to prioritize something other than the face in your portraits. Like for example, this strange black shape in the upper left-hand corner, to me calls way too much attention to itself. It leaps forward when really you want your background to push backwards into space, and yet this is calling so much attention to itself. So backgrounds are important because you want them to be there, but you don't want them to take away the attention from the main subject. So be really careful about that. Brainstorm more how you want to do those backgrounds. This piece I'm very interested in. However, it says in the description that it's a one-minute sculpture, and it's really hard for me to tell how this is a piece. Like, I can't figure out if the piece is a photograph, if it's an interactive piece, if it's a performance piece. If it is indeed a one-minute sculpture piece, then you need to shoot a video of it because I get the feeling looking at this that I'm not getting an accurate representation of what the piece is. I love the idea of you having a video and having a one-minute sculpture, but I feel like your presentation of the idea is quite confusing. So you really want to make sure that when you're showing your pieces that somebody really gets what it actually is. And shooting a video isn't always the easiest thing to do. You have to edit it. You have to make sure that the lighting is good. So I would see if you can get some assistance with that just so we can really get a sense for this piece because I don't feel like I can really critique it because it's not being accurately represented in the format that it is right now. I think, Hannah, you have a lot of great things going for you. I think your dedication, your passion for art definitely comes through in your portfolio. And I can see that you are somebody who has a very strong work ethic and all of those things are gonna benefit you tremendously. But what I think you really need to work on is diversity in terms of your materials you're working with, in terms of your subject matter. And I think in general, you just have to be a lot more experimental. I see you doing the same thing over and over and over again. And while practicing things is important, at this stage in your artistic development, you don't want to limit yourself in that way. You want to 
try a painting and put wax on it. Try a collage and paint on top of that. Make a 3D piece out of chipboard that you paint and collage on. There's a million different options for how you can do that. So I would really consider how much more you can expand your range. And probably what's gonna happen is you're gonna make a bunch of pieces that you don't like, and that's fine. You have to do that. You have to make bad pieces if you wanna make good pieces. And so it's very time consuming, but I think ultimately it's really gonna be worth your time because some Somebody with your passion combined with that level of diversity and experimentation, that's going to be a really wonderful combination of skills for you to have.